All right. Welcome, everybody. Let's have a moment of imitation of the bell together. Okay, so we've been working together for two weeks on uh, eco-spirituality. Um, focus now shifts somewhat more to the accessible part of the title. Uh, and so my idea is uh, to spend um, this week, and especially really today and, and tomorrow, but it'll hopefully accumulate beyond that. Uh, introducing the moderate flank, thinking about the moderate flank in relation to religion and spirituality, and there's a number of different ways in which you can do that, and I'll come to those. And what I want us to kind of get to tomorrow um, is priorities within the potential different avenues for moderate flank style work. Uh, in relation to religion and spirituality. And then maybe thinking some about the different kind of portals, the different way that people can access uh, what we've been talking about. And I'd like us to do some um, inquiry and some brainstorming as well as maybe uh, bringing what we feel we've learned so far uh, in relation to those uh, questions. And then hopefully by the time we get to, to next week, we'll uh, be starting to get into a position to uh, make ourselves some uh, recommendations, what kinds of things we think should be done, what kinds of things we would want to do, um, how to use existing evidence in as much as there is relevant evidence, um, uh, how um, uh, to uh, determine what the priorities might be for finding more such uh, evidence. Um, thinking about framings, uh, how, to, how to frame things so that they're um, uh, accessible, attractive, uh, etc. One of the things I encourage you to do is we do some of the um, exercises and so on that we'll be doing this week. Um, some of which we've done before, uh, is to think about how uh, accessible those uh, are, how they could be made more accessible, or to, to bring back here reflections uh, upon that. Really, the key concept that I have here, which is, um, which is explicit across the work I've done on the moderate flank, hopefully you've had a chance to read some of it, um, is, well, it's all about accessibility. It's all about how to be genuinely inclusive. Uh, and I'll talk more about some of the concrete aspects of that uh, in a minute. Um, but that's a kind of overarching frame. How do we reduce barriers to, to entry? And how do we do that without um, um, perjuring ourselves, without dumbing down, uh, without losing what's, uh, what's most valuable? That makes sense so far. Any questions so far? You saying that makes sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. So really what I mainly want to do this evening is to introduce the moderate flank and really kind of land that concept with you. Uh, and then towards the latter part, just kind of introduce some of the questions that arise around religion and spirituality in relation to the moderate flank. But it's going, to be it's going to be mainly moderate flank, and then tomorrow we'll get into the meat of the questions around religion, spirituality, etc., as they arise here. So, um, what am I talking about when I talk about the moderate flank? What is this? So, the best way to start in relation to this question is to think about and reflect upon the successes that the radical flank has enjoyed in the last few years. So, what's the radical flank? So these are terms from social movement uh, theory. Uh, and the basic idea of radical flanks um, is to go further 
than previous entities uh, in the space uh, have gone. Um, for a few reasons, uh, typically. One reason um, is because people think the existing entities in the space haven't gone far enough, and that's usually the main reason. Um, there are other reasons, though. Another quite interesting reason is that sometimes part of the motivation for having radical flanks is to make the whole agenda move such that uh, moderate flanks then seem even more, unre even more reasonable uh, and undeniable. So one way in which this is often talked about in sort of colloquial terms is um, if you have some people coming along and doing some spiky things, then suddenly the suits uh, um, look uh, a lot more reasonable and a lot more negotiable uh, with. Um, so um, the civil rights movement in the US was formed as a radical flank to the previously existing uh, organizations that had been advocating for rights for uh, black people in America. And then you've got Malcolm X and so on that came along as a radical flank to uh, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. And in both cases, um, it made uh, um, what had gone before seem incredibly reasonable and undeniable. And in particular, um, there's, there, there are, Martin Luther King sometimes says things like, um, look, you know, what we're, caught, what we're asking for here is, is really so uh, reasonable. Um, uh, if you don't get this, then you're going to get um, much worse stuff. You're going to get violence, uh, etc. Um, so a motivation for the radical flank, um, as well as being simply, we need to get more radical, um, is uh, to make um, positions that are slightly more moderate than it, than it seem incredibly reasonable. So what's happened in the last few years? Well, um, in September, uh, October 2018, you've got the birth of the youth climate strikes and the birth of Extinction Rebellion pretty much simultaneously. Um, Extinction Rebellion in particular was formed deliberately as a radical flank. It was formed quite deliberately to, um, uh, to take the, um, the discourse further than it had been taken before, to take the actions further than, than they had been taken before. It was formed uh, explicitly to move the so-called Overton window. The Overton window, it, that's an expression for the political agenda. What is considered politically possible? That's the Overton window. So there is, there's a set of questions that get debated on TV programs and in newspapers, etc. If you manage to move those questions so that, so that more radical questions uh, get mainstreamed, that's moving to the Overton window, and that's a massive uh, achievement. Extinction Rebellion was formed uh, to do that. Um, Extinction Rebellion was, uh, was formed as a radical flank, partly out of dissatisfaction with existing environmental organizations, what they'd achieved, and as a sort of wake-up call. So an interesting kind of little case in point of this is that one of the early uh, targets of Extinction Rebellion in autumn 2018, which surprised a lot of people, was Greenpeace. So Extinction Rebellion, they didn't occupy any government offices in autumn 2018, but they did go and occupy Greenpeace's office um, uh, and said, um, look, this is, this is the, as bad as radical it, as it gets, Greenpeace in the mainstream environmental movement, it's not radical enough. So we're, we're here to say, you know, we're going to put a spanner in the works of the government and so on and so forth, but also a little symbolic action against uh, Greenpeace. Now, um, I wasn't any part of that or anything. I'm not saying it was a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that is a clear signal of we are forming a radical uh, flank to the existing uh, movement. So uh, in 2019, um, I think it's fair to say that the radical flank in the shape of uh, the school climate strikes and Extinction Rebellion um, had um, a level of success that the environmental movement had not enjoyed for many, many years, for generations, basically. Um, I don't want to exaggerate how much success that was. Um, not much actually got changed in terms of uh, laws or government actions, although some things did. Uh, the most striking example, of course, was the British government legislating for net zero, which is the first time that happened in the world. 
Uh, and in my opinion, almost certainly wouldn't have happened without Extinction Rebellion in April 2019 and probably um, Greta uh, as well. Um, uh, but there was a clear um, shift in public consciousness. It's very, very clear in opinion polls. It's very striking in this country. It also occurred in other countries, although in different countries there are different balances of how much it was XR, how much it was uh, the school climate strikers, and how much it was, it was others. Um, uh, and in this country, in the UK, um, was where XR had its greatest success. Um, the school climate strikers had their greatest successes uh, in other countries, including Germany. Um, so the radical flank had success, moved the Overton window. The, the, this, the clearest example of this in the UK, as I say, we've got the net zero carbon law. We also got um, a climate citizens assembly um, introduced by parliament, um, which was a, a version of Extinction Rebellion's third demand and was not even on the agenda before. And we got a um, climate and environment um, declaration of emergency by Parliament, which was purely symbolic, but uh, nevertheless, it was um, part of the ask of, uh, of telling the truth. So the radical flank had some success in 2019 um, in the UK and in a number of other countries. Um, great. Um, what next? Um, since um, spring and summer of uh, 2019, I would argue that the radical flank has not enjoyed a very great success, even as its um, uh, fame continued to increase for some time. Um, we have seen uh, in the UK and other countries attempts to produce new radical flanks to, to outflank the, the uh, Extinction Rebellion and Greta radical flanks. So a classic example of that would be Insulate Britain. Uh, right now, there is Just Stop Oil in the UK and spreading to some other countries. Um, Just Stop Oil may have some success. Uh, the jury's uh, out at the moment. I think it's clear that Insulate Britain did not enjoy uh, success. Um, there have been uh, diminishing numbers coming to the radical flank. Um, so, you know, the question is, if you think the radical flank was successful in 2019, which I've argued briefly that I think it was, um, what should you do? Should you do more of the same? Should you go more radical? Or should you... Um, go to a more moderate flank type um, option. Um, and that is my argument that actually the success of the radical flank, the partial success of the radical flank, um, exactly means that the Overton window having been moved, the new political space that is available needs to be exploited. And the people who are in the best position to do that are not the radical flankers themselves because their appeal is is too uh, narrow. There are too many people who don't, don't like them. They, they made various missteps. Um, and um, they're never going to have a wide enough appeal. Um, so ergo, my call for uh, a new uh, mass uh, moderate flank, um, which I imagine will be distributed, by which I mean it's not going to be one organization. It's going to be loads of uh, organizations uh, and movements. What should be the characteristics of this moderate flank? Um, well, actually, before I come to that, um, any questions or comments on the little narrative I painted in the last five or ten minutes? Um, what should be the characteristics of this, uh, of this new uh, mass moderate flank? Well, crucially, it should keep the fundamental ingredient in the success of XR and Greta, uh, which was telling the truth, uh, authentic uh, emotional engagement, uh, resonance uh, in speeches, um, in actions, congruence between speeches uh, and actions, willingness to put uh, money where, where mouths uh, are, um, willingness to be emotional, to break conventions, to be disruptive, uh, etc. The extraordinary power that, uh, that Greta and some of the other um, school climate strikers have had to speak from the heart about the terrible position that their generation has been put in, um, to be uh, angry, to be sad, to be desperate. Um, and with XR, um, similarly, I, my uh, hope is that uh, history will, will judge that, that we did something similar from, uh, from the adult uh, perspective. 
Um, and um, yeah, I think that's the, the fundamental ingredient uh, in why it worked. So that should be kept. In fact, I would go slightly further. I think the, the truth telling can and should be uh, radicalized, uh, taken even further. Um, there's some elements of, of this in the Google Doc I just sent around, which maybe you'll have a chance to look at uh, before tomorrow. Um, and there's also elements of it in the postscript to my Perspectiva Moderate Flank piece, which hopefully you've seen before. Postscript being called how the moderate flank is, uh, is more radical than the, than the radical flank. Um, uh, and one of the ways that I think the moderate flank is or can be more radical is in telling the truth, including about how the situation is so bad um, that the demands, for example, the XR uh, issued um, are not credible now, even if they ever uh, were. Quite a lot of time has gone by. Um, XR hasn't changed its demands. Um, carbon neutral in, uh, carbon net zero in 2025 is completely not credible. Um, the idea that we're actually going to succeed in getting governments to do the right thing by demanding of them what they ought to do is tragically no longer credible. So what we need instead is uh, a longer grind, a, a march through the, uh, through the institutions and through the means of our life where we have power, which are not uh, only the, uh, the political and the uh, explicitly um, public uh, realm. Um, so I'll come to what the alternative means we have at our disposal are uh, in a moment. Um, what, what do you suggest yeah. seeing as, as solutions? Not, not carbon neutral weapons and fire weapons, what else? So um, I, I, not carbon neutral by 2025, certainly. Um, uh, I think insofar as demands are made, they should be things like just get on with it, just act as quickly as you can to decarbonize, stop destruction of biodiversity, nothing fancy, just like get on with it. But part of the, and part of the point I'm making is it should be less about demands. It should be less about uh, demands, especially in the public sphere, uh, and more about um, what we're going to do. Yeah, and that's another way in which I suggest that the moderate flank is radical and the rad radical flank uh, uh, less so. Um, that the moderate flank, as I envisage it, is partly about us, in the words of Rob Hopkins, just doing stuff uh, and not outsourcing it so much to entities which have uh, shown that they're not at present uh, capable of implementing uh, what is needed. So we should keep the truth telling. And here's the beautiful thing about the situation when you do that. When you keep the truth telling, in fact, you know, up the ante on it even more, and are really clear about how bad the situation is and how everybody uh, to this point, and especially governments, are failing us. Well, relative to that, moderate flank style action is a no brainer. I mean, no one can really refuse it. You know, people can come up with objections to um, blocking traffic uh, and what have you. Um, but who can object to doing everything we can, more or less, uh, within the law to deal with an absolutely, absolutely existential uh, emergency? Um, so uh, this seems to me one of the great powers uh, of the moderate flank, that it's, it's unanswerable. It's, it's un the case is unarguable. And, and this has very much been my experience so far, for example, when talking to business people about it. And business people are a tough uh, audience um, because, um, you know, they're often they're basically quite conventional. They're very nervous about anything that suggests of, of going up against uh, uh, established legal authorities, etc. cetera. Um, and when you say to them, look, here's the situation, it's really terrible. So what we're asking you to do is, um, is basically everything that you can do, more or less within the, the law, um, to deal with that situation. Are you up for it? And they sort of say, well, yeah, I mean, well, of course we've got to do it, haven't we? We've got to try everything, um, given how bad the situation is. So keep the truth telling. Relative to that, the moderate flank is a no-brainer. It's unarguable. So what's the difference then? What's, what are the key differences between the moderate flank and the radical flank? 
Well, it comes, it's central, central to it is this notion of inclusiveness. So firstly, including, the, including those who can't or won't go as far as the radical flank in what they do. Um, so people who are unable or unwilling to, uh, to break the law. Um, people who uh, want to uh, uh, do stuff that is um, seen as, or could be seen as broadly socially uh, acceptable. Secondly, to include those who don't want to be identified as activists. And in my opinion, this is a very important one. Uh, we always need to remember that, that people like us, and probably, the, well, let's have a quick show of hands. Who in this room would, in some context, at some time uh, in the present or in the recent past, be happy to uh, describe themselves as uh, an activist? So the majority of us, but not even all of us, uh, which is interesting. Um, activists are quite rare, right? This is a very unusual uh, group. If you get a random sample of the population and ask people how many of you are activists, very, very few people say yes. And people have all sorts of um, prejudices against activists. Now, of course, most of those prejudices are, are wrong and should be combated. So, uh, of course, we should be trying to make activism more socially acceptable. And it is certain, in my opinion, that there will be an upsurge of activism in the 2020s, given how terrible the situation is. That is certain. Um, the question is, will there be enough of an upsurge in activism? And my bet would be no. There will not be enough, given the, the terrifying scale of what we're uh, up against. So we have to look beyond that. Now, you might say, well, yes, but what you're talking about really is is getting people who don't want to think of themselves as activists to nevertheless be activists. And yeah, there'll probably be some of that uh, also that, uh, well, I think there'll certainly be some of that that uh, should happen and uh, will be happening. But I'm also saying something beyond that, and this is the point of the exchange uh, that I've had with Anthea Lawson, uh, who's been thinking a lot about activism um, in recent years. Um, I think there's a, a whole class of activity uh, action, doing stuff, which doesn't have to be regarded um, as activism at all. And I'm going to describe uh, what that is um, in just a second. Um, so yeah, let's turn to that. What are the key areas where I see the, the moderate flank as being able to act? Because there are others, but I'm going to just mention the, the key areas. And they're really um, two or three, depends how you classify it. Um, business and workplaces and geographic communities. So start with business and, uh, and workplaces. Um, most people um, work somewhere. Uh, and Marx argued, and I think he's still basically right, that we systematically underestimate how much power we have uh, where, we, where we work. We're sort of encouraged by the kind of society we live in to think, well, politics is all about voting, and voting is something that you do you know, once every few years, and, that, and that's it, just that, just that moment. Um, whereas people, many people spend you know, three, four, five, six, eight, ten uh, hours a day uh, uh, at work. Uh, and this is sort of, there's at least two different ends of the telescope to come at this from. One is the, is the end of, uh, of those who are running or owning um, uh, places of work. Uh, I like the phrase workplaces because it's kind of neutral. You can think of that workplaces have uh, business people in them, but they also have employees uh, in them and so on and so forth. Um, um, yes? Yeah, so I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking that broadly under the heading of uh, of businesses and workplaces. So what you're talking about really is is finance, right? Uh, and you could uh, you could classify it differently, but I'm kind of thinking of it as all part of the same thing. My view would be that finance is a particularly crucial part of uh, uh, business. It's particularly crucial because well, um, it has such power in, in our time. Um, there's very little that uh, most businesses can do uh, without finance. And also, under the finance heading, there are other more specific um, aspects of business activity 
such as um, insurance. Now, insurance is a really, really interesting one and is going to be, I think, a key focus for the moderate flank for a number of reasons. So insurance is, uh, you know, there's loads of money in insurance. Um, uh, where that money gets invested is important. But there's much, there's much bigger reasons to be interested in insurance uh, in particular. Uh, one key reason um, is that um, insurers' interests are to quite a significant extent aligned with activists' interests. Now, that's very unusual. Very unusual that you have a big sector of the business world, let alone the finance world, where it's really in their interests um, that we win. Um, why is it in the interest of insurers that, that, that we win? There's multiple uh, reasons. One reason is that um, whenever um, uh, disasters uh, happen, uh, insurers lose. Um, another related reason is that it's in insurers' interest for there to be as few claims uh, uh, as possible. Another related reason is that as we move into the terror incognito that we're moving in, this dangerous new world that we're moving into, there is more and more likelihood of insurers and reinsurers going bankrupt because they will have losses that are so huge they won't be able to pay them out at all. Uh, and another uh, related but distinct reason um, is that in the world that we're moving into, there will, there will be, unless we, we manage to figure things out very cleverly, there will simply be less and less insurance because there will be more and more risks that are uninsurable. So the insurer, insurers, on the best case scenario for insurers, on anything remotely like a business as usual model, the market for insurance gets smaller and smaller because there's less and less things that it actually makes uh, financial sense for insurers to insure. And now remember something that I said uh, a couple of weeks ago when we started out here, um, the, the remark of, uh, of Feuerbach, the, the guy who Marx uh, uh, argued against, um, why do we need God when we have fire engines and insurance companies? Well, the future we're moving into, insurance companies are at risk. So either we've got to figure the world out or we're going to need God again, um, or both. Uh, uh, well, well, there's always fire engines, yeah. Uh, but uh, but uh, <laughs> um, it'd be better to have insurance companies as well. Um, so you see where I'm, where I'm going with this. Insurance is a really, really interesting totemic part of the, of the picture. Um, and the, the, the interest of it intersects quite directly with what we've been thinking about um, in the last couple of weeks. Insurance, therefore, makes a lot of sense um, as a key kind of target for the moderate flank. So uh, some, um, some stuff is happening in this area already. There are people in the insurance world who get this and who are potential um, allies. Uh, and there are people outside the insurance world who get the importance of insurance and are, are starting to work on it and, and, and target it. Uh, so it's starting to happen, uh, and I want to be instrumental um, in uh, helping ensure that it happens more. So that's business and workplaces as a key target for the moderate flank. Uh, the other overwhelming example, I think, is geographic communities. Nearly everybody uh, lives somewhere. Um, and uh, um, where you live, you have um, some power, partly because you have... Uh, uh, local knowledge, uh, partly because you have at least the potential to, if not the actuality, of some kind of community, um, uh, and partly because where people live is a key locale for, um, for thinking about and enacting um, adaptation. Um, uh, and if we're thinking about, which we started to sort of talk about a bit here, um, what are the what are the key leverage points? What are the places where the moderate flank could put pressure on and leverage exceptional results? I, I'd argue that everything related to adaptation um, is potentially really significant for reasons that we've talked about over the past uh, couple of weeks. Um, adaptation makes it real uh, to people. Um, uh, adaptation uh, is about the here and now, not the distant uh, future. Uh, adaptation is how we're letting down the global south, but also how we're letting down ourselves. Um, adaptation um, uh, really matters. 
uh, and the, and um, uh, the sense in which what we're trying to do here on this residency is uh, about a kind of aspect of adaptation is obviously potentially uh, relatable um, to this. So um, these are the, the, the most fundamental categories, it seems to me, where the moderate flank could work. And you see what I'm getting at when I say it's about um, doing stuff. Uh, it's not just about demanding stuff of others. Um, some of the stuff that you do might be demanding stuff of others. For example, one of the reasons why business is important is that businesses have enormous lobbying power vis-a-vis -vis the government. Right? Governments really listen to businesses in a way they don't tend to listen to citizens or pretty much anybody else. Right? If we can get uh, businesses to lobby for a higher level playing field for everybody, um, rather than for regulatory exemptions, well, that's a total uh, game changer. That's a total game changer. Um, so, so some of the, the power that we have in these places is about um, influencing others, but quite a lot of it is just direct. Um, think of all the, the things that, uh, that, um, that businesses uh, can do if, if they are led um, uh, inspirationally, if they change their, um, um, their ownership models, uh, or if they have strong pressure on them from their employees or from trades unions, whatever it is, it could be different in different cases. Um, everything from reducing the, the uh, carbon footprint of their own uh, uh, enterprise and of all of their uh, suppliers and potentially influencing their, their customers, what they could do with their, with their profits, what they do, as I say, with their lobbying power, hugely significant, what they do with their brand power, hugely significant. You know, imagine, think of the difference between businesses that advertise in such a way that all they're interested in doing is kind of raking in short term profits, no matter what the exploitation that results, and businesses that are actually interested in um, uh, having some kind of uh, better world result and not just more of their own sales. I'm thinking of businesses like um, Patagonia or Ecosia. Um, uh, we could talk about very specific businesses if folks wanted. So those are some of the main ways in which businesses can um, or could um, do uh, good and be genuinely uh, green, um, even without having yet successfully um, um, influenced the government uh, uh, to change. So um, part of what I'm interested in us exploring um, is um, where might be the best uh, uh, leverage points here, where might be the best uh, uh, influence here, where is there the greatest uh, uh, potential. Um, uh, now, there's one more thing I want to say before I get on to the relevance of uh, uh, religion and spirituality a bit more. Um, one more way in which it will be important, in my opinion, and my argument for the moderate flank to be inclusive. It should include, it should be genuine about seeking to include those who don't necessarily agree with us um, politically. This is something which XR claimed to be uh, in favor of, but it's not clear how genuine that claim was. Um, uh, if we manage to uh, operate in such a way that people think, look, this is really about a struggle in which we're all potentially uh, in it together. It's, it goes beyond politics. It's about a shared potential future. Um, and it's not um, about conventional uh, political disagreements. Well, that's part of the way that there could be um, a really mass uh, movement here in a way that the radical flank did not manage to become truly uh, mass. And this, again, of course, is related to what we were exploring a few minutes ago about what if we started to think beyond an, uh, a, an agenda of, uh, of activism? What if we started to think about action uh, that could be taken um, on a mass basis in a number of key uh, uh, locales, um, which was not pigeonholeable in a certain place in the culture wars or in a certain place on the political spectrum? Well, the, then you're really kind of reducing barriers to entry. Right, so that too is part of the vision. Obviously, potentially a controversial part. Could uh, we could discuss it? Um, but uh, that idea that uh, 
uh, that XR had of being beyond party politics or beyond ideology in the context of an emergency which is, uh, which is transformative uh, and which enforces um, a much wider and deeper concern than there has been hitherto. That's part of what uh, encourages me to think that something like the, the, the moderate flank uh, approach um, could be the way to go and could be the way to be genuinely inclusive. Right, before I turn uh, explicitly to religion and spirituality, um, I want to stop and take a good round of questions and thoughts because I've now said the majority of the vast majority of what I wanted to say this evening in introducing the moderate flank. Is this making sense to people? Do you have uh, uh, concerns, questions of clarification, objections, whatever? Yeah. And I've noticed that at least in Holland, there's um, maybe because we've got two traditional corona times in one year, but there's now well, even friends of mine who say, oh, it's climate change, it's not just whatever you want. It's so. You think that climate change denialism has grown again? Yeah. I, wow. At least I feel in my spiritual group around me. Huh. Mm. Um, that it's been that that's like the next thing that they are um, saying. You know, maybe, maybe they doubt, and it's not that it's happening, but that the agenda for for uh. change, you know, is it going too fast, or it's not legitimate, or it's just to get power into the wrong hands. And there's uh -huh. a lot of, okay. And I. I don't even know how to approach this anymore because it feels to me, for the first time for me, it feels like I thought we were all sort of in that moderate phase, <laughs> no? Yeah. And that we at least agreed on that. Um, so I find that fascinating that I think, oh no, this is because I feel that there's so much love for nature coming from this. Yes. Me. So that's, that, yeah, that's me a little bit deeper. <laughs> but I don't know if any of you recognize that. It's just, or it's just been going on. It's quite a depressing account. I, I hope it's just been going on in Holland. <laughs> what does anyone else think? I feel that I don't think there is a lack of willingness to confess grief and acceptance in these spaces. And it's very real in the groups that I just yes. went into for the most informal start was yeah, just feeling lost and feeling like that that is a key to acknowledging these things for me. In my opinion. I don't know if that's the same for you. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and like for a long time, I was more in, in that state of feeling like every, you know, everything might not be okay, but everything is okay. It's like I, I was yes. just more in that space. Um, so I know that a lot of people are sort of spending time in that space with people. So I sometimes do and, and there as well. So in that way, I, I totally understand that. Um, but there is, yeah, it's sort of this positive thought in work. Like if you can't go into the pain too much, uh, then stay positive. Uh -huh, so yes. Underlying that, um, but in Holland, it's now uh, a lot of spiritual groups are sort of coupled to far right movements. Oh God! Because they okay. they were the only ones in, in sort of the Corona times who said we don't want these. They were the only ones sort of speaking up against some of those. Yes. And so now these groups have changed completely. Yes. Uh, and 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 these far right uh, groups are climate uh, deniers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just, that's only a thought. So that, that last part, I think, is somewhat specific to the Netherlands, I think. Um, yeah. What has happened in the UK, for example, is that there has been some penetration of, of far-right um, groups into spiritual and sort of well-being groups by way of COVID denial. Yeah. But I think that it hasn't really coupled to climate denial in the UK. But it sounds like it has where yeah, you are. I, I've just noticed, and, and yeah, like I said, even with, with good friends of mine that I'm now a little bit at a loss, but I'm thinking, oh, maybe yeah. now I don't know how to bridge this. So this is really interesting. Like, I, I'm, mm. I'm, I mean, I didn't raise my hand, but I'm active. I feel sometimes active, but I wouldn't necessarily 
always have an entry, but because I'm always sort of filling the space, it maybe everything is okay when it's just how it needs to go, you know, that feeling. But you mean you mean thinking of that way in a spiritual in way? A more non non dual entry. Yes. Like yes. And and I I'm the witness witnessing what is happening. Of course, yes. I through my doing. Yeah, so we explored that quite a lot last week, and we'll be exploring it again later yeah. later this week. In the sense of, in the sense of, really accepting one's grief and really accepting one's thirst for justice and so on and so forth, and the way that that uh, uh, makes things look quite different uh, spiritually. Yeah. But what you say is very very interesting and 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 pertinent, Leah. Yeah, yeah, I think. Cause for reflection about certain forms of you know, deeper spirituality that there's a bit of a, a religious belief in any of these awakening institutions that are essentially going to be yeah. a kind of statement of rapture. And yeah. uh, when you run into that belief being falsified, yeah. people will want to keep the belief yeah. and then deny the fact that yeah. it's actually yeah. just an opinion. That yeah. Uh, what you say, moderate plans. Yeah. Um, in, in that way, it's it's really I feel really ashamed that it now seems to be that that climate has been a little bit piled onto that pile of they want to control us and say that. I mean, there's now yes. lots of things going on with the climate in the Netherlands. Yes. Have to scale down and all that. A lot of Dutch people getting angry about this. So it seems like they're pushing it a little bit into that corner of oh, the government wants to. Everything for us, we're not safe in it, and then start to deny some of these things. Yeah. I'm, I'm slowly, I'm scratching, you know, I'm seeing it a little bit. Yes. Even calling the sea extinction is still a few months. Yeah. Maybe even be a problem soon. Yeah, yeah, I know. But so that's the weird thing about the UK, it's a little bit yes. nicer, like a yeah. protected insulator. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the Netherlands is, is one of, well, it's I probably know. the most vulnerable developed. Country yeah, but we to have, climate. Uh, in our government, real, real strong is still sort of the moderate right mm -hmm. that that's that's been strong for more than a decade now. It's again it won in the last elections of last year, uh, completely won, and it's still um, even when asked, would you call climate now a crisis? So we actually act faster. They they now say that they're gonna act faster. Right. But the the spokeswoman, you know. Still said, I'm not calling it a, a crisis, but it's like we need to think about this. We need to look at this. We can handle this. We can deal with this. Take action. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I think if that's sort of the majority of the call, that I feel that you, you're ahead of people. It's, it's still quite hard, even the moderate. Yeah, yeah. Know. I mean, what I'm trying to do yeah. here is to is to co-create a way to step around the the culture wars. Mm -hmm step around political divisiveness, yeah. to get into a position where we might be able to get truly mass buy-in. And by the way, part of the reason why it's crucial to get truly mass buy-in is that what we need is a systemic transformation. And that is not something you can do by a form of Leninism. It's not something you can, you can do by um, uh, leveraging political change that comes from just a kind of passionate minority. It has to involve a broad swathe of the public, so so part of the way I see it is, we need to have a far larger um, segment of the population willing to 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 be active, um, much larger than the than the activists, um, and an even larger set um, who are willing to at least go along with that, and this is an effort to kind of get into the space where that might be possible. Um, Pip and then Ailey, okay, Ailey, yeah. Noticing is, I feel like the majority of the population just 
might not have the capacity, the mental capacity, the emotional capacity, the time capacity to actually like face these issues. And I know I've not been to every session, so this might have already been touched upon. But um, for me, that seems like it has power to like looking back. I feel like for me, I think it's like a big step to just kind of like let it fly. I feel like the the goal that they've actually made it to in COP twenty six is mm. like you know military goal, um, yeah. mobilized globally. Like that seems to be a model that flies, but it was like one day. I think it was a Saturday. There was excitement involved. It was quite. It was an easy thing for people to get behind. I think like I just like when people are like working in these ridiculous hours, most of my friends who are similar have like waged their right to like maximum hours they work the week. Like most people are working like fifty plus hours. Mm. Like and their aim is to earn money and then to spend the money on holidays and buying things and streaming. That's what I've talked about. And just I feel like just when people just don't have the capacity to face this mm. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's a lot of truth in that. I guess what I'm trying to offer is some potential ways in given that situation. So part of the reason for thinking, well, if we focus uh, here and here, we might have a chance of getting somewhere is because these are things that people are doing um, anyway, as it were, uh, and that where they already have some association or some, at least some kind of easy capacity for association, some kind of uh, some kind of uh, shared uh, uh, interest, some kind of kind of local, um, and that um, maybe it's going to be easier to sustain uh, action there than it is by getting people to focus on something which is sort of external in the way that um, uh, a climate march or protest or or something is is for most people seems to be something quite kind of other than their than their lives. Um, uh, and uh, and maybe in that way, well, because basically a lot of people who go to a march are going to be people who are basically more or less willing to consider themselves an activist. Um, so it comes back to that to that point is one way of putting it. How do we how do we leverage a lot of people who are not in the activist pond and then get them to leverage something beyond? That's the hope. So, yeah, I think yeah. I just Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, like completely agree with you. Like, I think it's like for me, intersectionalities. I know that we have a really thick minority that are involved with and get really people on the other side to like really kind of get serious mentally around like why well, people don't get involved in other issues and they, you know, it's not an equal society and that people have other struggles. Um, they pick up not everyone, but like I just think going into that will. Yes. Yeah. For example, like the most recent major thing that happened in Iran, which was like a disaster, was a perfect example of intersectionality because they basically put in all on, um, yeah, very wealthy streets around all the cars and everything going around all the kind of poorer areas of Iran. And mm. I didn't know New York at that point, but why was it like no one went back? Um, and they kept blaming it, but no one could understand it. Was that by the Iranian Yes, yes. So on the first stuff, I guess we'll be doing some of that on uh, Wednesday. Um, let's let's pursue that. Um, yeah, in terms of the in terms of how this could work in politics, I mean, obviously that's really interesting and important. But I'm kind I've kind of put that to one side a bit here. Because what I'm trying to to get at is um, where are the big possibilities for something which is which is 
uh, new and themes outside the political space. But I'm very happy to talk about how it can work in politics as well, because it is very important. Okay. And when you say that group, what do, what do you mean? Oh, yes, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm. Brandon? Um, love that you were talking about action. Um, when you were talking about business work back in 2008, I saw them as two independent parts of being a good business. Yeah. So I don't think they are. Okay. Um, I actually think we can align both of those, because one of the things for me is don't have spending and knowledge of how to get from one year to the other. Mm. So I think there's an opportunity there. Mm. Insurers are as thick rather than a pound. Um, they like the house, they like casinos. But as soon as the casino's profit goes up to where it needs to be on spot, then there could be a good incentive and a good stick for driving. So whilst I believe you're right, insurers are part of this strategy, I don't think there's a right one to align where we need to get to. And that is grassroots community action. And that, I believe, will get more people involved. Well, OK, so this is part of what I'd like us to, to talk about more tonight and tomorrow. What are the... What are the one way of putting that question is, what's the best bang for your buck? What's the priority? I think you're making a case that that uh, geographic communities uh, are really where we should be focused. But you, then you've got this connection to being maybe funded by businesses, which is great. I think um, they have to hold their hands. This goes back to the pitch from, from your point. I think you have to hold them, hold their hands. Find the people in those communities that you can trust and build them up. Yeah. Link them with and tell, show them what they should be doing. Or, yeah. How to put it? A recipe. Yeah. Set them off and then go, well, that's what's done this. And so I'm thinking of the great work in the UK, and we, we should be praising companies like Crown Estates, what they're doing on this pain front. Legal in general um, have their moments. Um, a few of the big pension funds are looking at 100 euros. Insurers are, in, in my experience, a little bit. Yeah, look, it, the, the point about insurers, it, I'm not trying to say insurers are, are, are doing a great job or whatever, they're mostly not. Um, that I think there is real potential for that to be changed. And I would make the case that there is enormous potential in workplaces and, uh, and businesses, partly because a, a lot of these people live in the real world uh, and, and they're not fooled by tabloid headlines or the Telegraph or whatever. Uh, they understand uh, increasingly uh, how bad the situation is, whatever their politics. Um, and uh, a lot of them have a lot of power, uh, including lobbying power and brand power, which are absolutely huge. Sorry. What prevents them from acting? Oh, well, yeah, well, what prevents them from acting is, yeah, it's various things, isn't it? So sometimes it's shareholders. Yeah, generally, yeah. 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 Um, uh, there are obviously market constraints that sometimes make it difficult for them to, to act. Um, but I mean, another way of looking at what prevents them from acting is, um, I think that it's to some extent just sort of inertia and a sense of kind of it's not necessarily our job, uh, and um, uh, not wanting to be seen to rock the boat too much and so on. And those things I think can be changed. So that's why I'm quite hopeful. What's that? Unreleased. So much freer. Yeah. Yeah. And also, of course, all, what everybody has in common, basically, is there's huge amounts of hopelessness and huge amounts of a sense of, oh, you know, we're, we're, no one listens to us, we're never going to be enough, etc. And that is one of the key things that I'm, I'm hoping we might be able to change. The, if we could get this kind of sense of, of there's a kind of movement happening across these and more, um, then people start to get the sense of, oh, actually, you know, so these people are doing it in their geographic community, and these lawyers are doing it, and these insurers, and then there's this business over here, and uh, it's actually, there's something happening here, some big thing that we could be uh, a part of. Alien and Liam? Um, so, with regards to, like, the businesses that have been doing it, and the ones that are
and and I think while that is still like the absolute priority, um, I think it's really hard to shift. Yeah. I think it's so hard to shift the priority from it's not grow. You might need to de degrow. Yeah. You you might need to like yeah not get as much profit to continue to sort of save the world. Yeah. I just I just feel like that's not registered yet, and like and I think that's and I. I think that's going to be like the main thing in trying to the issue is getting businesses to realise that the priority right now is not money and it's not maximising the rate of return. Yeah. It's being built to this. Yeah. And I guess I was just really interested in how in the world you can like shift that because once you tackle that, yeah. then all of the lobbying will hopefully not be lobbying governments on behalf of business interests. Yeah. Like yeah. Great. So. Um, firstly, I'd say um, you're, you're right, but there are significant things that can be done even within those constraints. So here's an example. Um, if a business is, is interested in maximizing uh, its profit, um, one way to do so uh, is by getting a really good reputation. This connects with, with brand power as a, a business which is um, a decent business and a, a business which can be trusted, a business with a, with a product which is not going to uh, kill you, et cetera, et cetera. And the best way to do that, the best way to do that at the end of the day is not to hire PR agencies. No. No. No, the best way to do it at the end of the day is actually to do it because then no one can catch you out. Right? Just like the best way to, um, to, um, for a politician to come over uh, as believable is to actually uh, believe what they're saying. And I've got a nice little example of this I can, I can share with you, because people have the same kind of skepticism about politicians, right? Um, so my local uh, MP, uh, Clive Lewis of Labour, um, when he started out in politics, he did a lot of mouthing green platitudes, because the Green Party is very strong where I live in Norwich, because we built it up, we built it up over, over years. So he knew he had to sound green. Uh, in order to have a chance of winning enough votes from Greens to win the election. Um, but over time, he's changed. He's gradually become more and more a Green. And my reading of why he's done this um, is very simple. It's that, it's that he comes over in speeches well and can be less caught out by hostile questioners, etc., if he actually believes it. And I, I'm certain now that he, while he didn't used to believe it, he does now. Uh, that, can, that can happen, and it's similar things can happen in the business world. But look, set, set that on one side even. Your, the, your fundamental analysis is right. So what do we do about it? So one thing is that we need to support businesses which are not um, for-profit limited liability companies. And there are many of them of all different uh, kinds. Another thing is we need to challenge the, uh, the model of limited liability companies through uh, through law and through politics. And there are now increasing numbers of businesses who are interested in being involved in that, in trying to stop it from being the case that uh, businesses um, that are limited liability companies have to operate in that way. Now, that is starting to get to a point where, where it could be quite exciting. So in other words, part of the sort of broad strategic ambition of the moderate flank um, could be to create a situation where in, I don't know, six or seven years' time, you might have a, a change in the law such that it was not the case that limited liability companies were required to maximize uh, shareholder value anymore. That's the only way that ultimately you stop corporations behaving like psychopaths, I think. Liam? Yeah, I mean, I just think that there's a few things that we really should get through more of it. Catastrophic climate change. Because we're yeah. because we're because we're looking at this short term profit and, and, and really only the short term profit, right? And taking it for granted that that is going to be a sufficient thing. And yes, and in that lens, then it's been sort of interesting to see more things, especially as a person who's a situation taker and a situation maker, right? To respond by stopping the short term profit, like I can't do anything. All the other companies are going to do. They're going to destroy the environment. I might as well get another profit if I can before we collectively totally destroy everything, right? And that the stock can do it. 
And, you know, you can just buy it from the web page and whatnot, right? It's kind of where, you know, people are, that's what people are thinking, more or less, right now, at that level. So, but that's obviously an ugly bad future from everybody's individual worst interest. Yes. A much better future is if actually they get together, lobby the government to change the rules of business such that basically, yeah, well, overall we won't make you know, as much money as we did, but, but everybody has a better future, right? And that has to do basically with businesses lobbying the government to totally change the rules of business. Yeah. But they can't do that, obviously, right? And I think that is part of, it's almost like what I would think is the highest value thing is getting CEOs of companies to say that because yeah. that totally undercuts neoliberal ideology. Exactly. Yeah, you get a CEO of companies saying, look, that's a fairy tale. We need new laws. Yes. Basically, the government needs to create a playing field that actually allows businesses to lose this country, or else they won't. Um, you know, that... Got as much as we know. What's that? Well, no, but let, but let's, they, they don't even they don't really have to know what it looks like. The, the the way it starts is by this being news. Yeah. I mean, this is incredible news. This is what I'm trying to engineer this year, working with working with a bunch of businesses who are interested in this in this model. Um, if you get CEOs saying that we want you to regulate us tougher, we want you to make it impossible for uh, limited liability companies to destroy the earth for everybody's you know and everybody's. Uh, uh, loss. We want you to get serious now about using the Ukraine war to effect a green transition, etc. That is news because the whole model of the last two generations has been, no, what it's all about is freeing up businesses to pursue profits, creating a free market, reducing the political sphere, etc. So just that is an, en it's an enormous kind of mind bomb um, if we go down that route. Really, all of the consultancies work across industries and really understand how business works and kind of get a lot of people who spend a lot of time in the room together, like they've you know, done their own economist thing and called Create the Force, they were made by Mitsubishi in, in Japan. They're kind of like, okay, well, how are we going to construct a completely new, you know, or a threat and waste, you know, and, and, and basically look at, well, we have this objective, and they wouldn't know what they're naming. There's no way. Nobody's ever actually done it before. Like, well, actually, we just need to design a new way of doing things. People were thinking about it in the 50s and 60s, but nobody's done it for the last 70 years. But just to paraphrase what I think you said, is you don't have to actually redo the whole thing. Just protect decent organizations from their shareholders by a clause in there saying, do not do any environmental impact. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's going to be enough, but that is a fundamental thing. That addresses the heart of what Ailey was asking. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's fundamental, uh, sooner or later, that we have to get to something like that, Amit. So, one of the big challenges in the kind of structural things for business is actually we live in a bubble ecosystem and it's not uh, isolated to one country or globalized. Yeah. Right? Especially if you respect you know, large structures of you know, like public companies. And so, we really, when we look at that category of business, workplaces, and small retail insurance, it really, they have really, really Finance is fundamentally based on capital, and capitalism is going to be anathema to everything we're talking about. So then we get into things can be very, very difficult because the insurance is going to be a little closer. Certain kinds of localized businesses are going to be slightly closer. Yeah. Yeah. Selling and buying companies is one of the big ways of you know, extracting value from public companies, putting it in bank pockets, you know, encumbering them with debt as soon as it falls. You know, it happens to stock markets and the, and the levels buy out and then those folks go into private equity business and then into family business. So they destroy all, so much inherent value. Mm. So um, uh, security companies. Can't, they're, they're, they're 
foundation is still here, the family foundation is still owned as a stock, and benefits from the you know whatever the stock movement does. And the research that those folks were in in Denmark who were talking about how they really good good website and um, organizational brand for this for this type of kind of technology for mm -hmm. governance technology. And according to them, their those security companies perform thirty percent better than their yeah, it's very interesting. And it's not surprising for the reason you just gave, that, that the non-steward companies often get hollowed out. Yeah. Yeah. And just to give you just a clear, the steward companies are doing all decisions by doing so, including their internal compensation. So they're sustaining themselves, and, and they're not, and, and those steward companies who typically, so John Lewis is a steward company, mm. so their, their employees have some form of stock in the business side, but many of the steward models don't have any, any form of stock, they do not stock in terms of the actual operating rewards for Managers, because when they have, when managers are incentivized by stock options, they're very perverse incentives. They become very short term. Mm -hmm. because when they ride this wave, they're getting, the, the managers are getting, are using, are getting the benefits, the financial benefits, the finance guys are getting. So they love it because they make a hell of a lot more money, but it's detrimental to the company's long term mm -hmm. growth. So in the 70s, average Fortune 100 company CEO salary as a multiple of the average salary mm. in, of his organization was somewhere around uh, 15 to 18 to 17,000 dollars a company. Yeah, it was, you know, like we at Coco was making was making a little bit more than the average, but you know, he was making like say 20 times as much as the average the average salary in the 1960s. Now that multiple has gone to somewhere in you know something between 300 and 500 a year. Mm. Okay, sorry, but what a crazy you know asymmetry in the audience. So that's yeah. something Totally. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> the second yeah. there's two more things I want to share with you. The second thing is there's in Japan, which is often you know for the US tradition, we think about things in a little bit different way and they're really, really facing you know, an aging population. So they've got this this thing called Society Five uh, which might be worth everyone to look at because they, they kind of understand how to use technology and support yeah. communities because yeah. technology is drastically devalued. Right. So they're they know they have to re rebalance this power within Still have kind of a fairly strong head of, head of you know, kind of culture in some aspects. I think not as big as it was you know, ten years ago, but there's still some ability for a collaborative collaborative conversation between business and government and stakeholders. Mm. What's also interesting in Japan is they've been living in essentially a post growth economy for a long time now. Unfortunately, they haven't been living in it by choice, but they have been living in it. There's some lessons from that too. Exactly, and that they don't. They don't and the last thing I was going to say for the motion was that maybe uh, it's like we need to get the office, we need to make an office where the office, where the character in the office is going through this existential crisis. Oh. And that can change in that storytelling. And it's like a mm. mass market commercial brand that's telling a new story. Nice. Yeah. That's one of the things that I want to get on to tomorrow. We're coming towards the end this evening. I'll have to take you in a second, Pip, but just to, just to say on that, um, that um, I'm interested in uh, exploring tomorrow the priorities between uh, these and with regard to what we haven't started talking about yet, but which sort of once I kind of created this framework, sort of got added into it um, by people coming to me, people like Liam and other people. Uh, religious and spiritual uh, uh, organizations uh, and different ways in which they might be part of uh, the moderate flank and starting to think about the um, what's that? Mental health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could, we could do that as well. Yeah, I was thinking of that. Um, um, and um, what was I going to say? Um, uh, oh yeah, and the, and to start to to think and to brainstorm a bit about the the various kind of portals uh, in, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and popular culture and art being a potentially um, uh, crucial one. Um, so that's where I want us to go tomorrow. So come with your you your thinking and creative caps tomorrow evening, Pip.
Fall für das damalige Regime selbst und haben nicht für die Regierung die Wohnung der Bürgerkollegen eben hier zu erlösen. Ich habe die Bitte, dass der Präsident von Polen nach der Wohnung nach Polen und damit die Wohnung nach der 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 Wohnung nach Well, that's a very strong claim. I mean, I, I think it's probably a true claim, but I don't think you can take it for granted. Uh, I think that there are alternative uh, uh, strategies. And I want us to think about um, how we go down the track which you are suggesting, which I think we should go down, um, in a way which doesn't uh, create new uh, barriers to entry. So one of the things that I'm really keen for us to talk about is how can we help to contribute and facilitate um, inner work for the moderate flank and inner work for activism. Um, how can we best do that and how can we best do that in a way which doesn't put people off?